There are quite a few James Bond games out there, for good or worse, although one is likely to always come to the forefront of most minds when video games and the franchise are compared. I'm of course talking about 007 Racing, released for the PlayStation in the year 2000. No, I'm bloody not. I'm of course referring to GoldenEye on the N64, released in 1997. I'm covering neither of those today, however, instead focusing your attention towards James Bond 007, released on the Game Boy just a year later. While this was developed by Sapphire Corporation as opposed to Rare, they both share the same publisher, the big N themselves, Nintendo. These two originally comprised of a planned trio to be published by Nintendo Towers, with the third title destined for the doomed Virtual Boy. I'm personally a big fan of the James Bond series, and have been since I was a kid. I even own a complete set of the 007 Spy Files magazine and trading card series from the early 2000s, which, as far as I know, is still somewhere in my parents' shed. That does mean I've obtained a small collection of the franchise's games over the years, and while I am interested in checking those out in due time, let's begin by discovering how it fared on the original Game Boy. While this came out a year after GoldenEye, and it seems that the Virtual Boy version was to be based on the movie too, it might surprise you to know that this version has a completely unrelated storyline. It incorporates an entirely original narrative that sticks to the tenets you'd expect from the average Bond film. 007 loves martinis, is an absolute scumbag towards women, and the environments switch between continents with every scene change. Old school series favourites, Old Job and Jaws even make guest appearances, which is certainly a welcome fan service. The story is surprisingly in-depth, incorporating many different characters and subplots, but the gist is, is that an evil Russian general plans to start a nuclear war so we can rule the world or some other such nonsense. Regardless, it follows the more campy formula of the original films from the 60s to the 80s, certainly not seeming to take itself too seriously, as opposed to the more recent action film oriented Bronson and Craig flicks. 007 games are universally first person shooters, apart from 007 Racing I guess, but that is a vehicle combat game. I didn't know much about this 8-bit incarnation of Bond before playing it for this review, so the gameplay came as a welcome shock. Surprise, it's an RPG. Yes, in the vein of The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, a teeny weeny Bond traverses isometric levels, chatting with NPCs, finding and using items, and of course, utilising the latest weapons and gadgets from Q Branch. There are a few standout moments that were unrelated to combat, like in one segment where you're constantly trading up items in a Marrakesh black market to get what you need, or another where you're dumped in the Sahara Desert to die and must make it out to an airbase before you run out of water. One particularly memorable mission requires a probably half-drunk Bond to successfully gamble enough to gain access to a high rollers room in order to contact a baddie. You're given a $1,000 line of credit courtesy of the UK taxpayer and get to play games such as Blackjack and Baccarat. These are simple versions that are to be expected on the Game Boy, but are certainly a nice break from the usual gameplay. As a bonus, on completion of the game, you will receive codes so you can play them whenever you wish. Nice. Otherwise, there are continual smaller puzzles which involve gaining as much information from the locals as possible, and then combining the correct items with the environment to progress. These aren't always obvious either, requiring a bit of noggin usage. Unexpected for a Bond game, but certainly welcome. Resource management is achieved through a basic but functional inventory. Any items picked up can be viewed here, and there doesn't seem to be a max limit on how much you can hold. Items are assigned for usage using the A and B buttons, meaning two can be used in the gameplay at the same time. Navigating certain levels can be troublesome, however, since they can be urban mazes. You'll spend a lot of time trial and erroring routes and attempting to find objectives, which certainly made the numerous walkthrough guides online tempting considering how samey everything looks. At a point in the game you are given a GPS which acts as a quote unquote map, but it's completely useless. All it shows is a blank grid with a flashing square indicating your location. A featureless grid is about as helpful as you can imagine, especially since the mazes zigzag and cross routes all over the place. I also found the combat to be particularly weak, probably the weakest link in the entire game if we're being honest. At the start you only have access to your fists, with the fighting system based around waiting for an opponent to an attack, blocking it, and then whacking them one back as they're stunned. At first, you'd assume this requires a degree of timing and skill, but pro tip. You can just hold the block button until they're stunned. 
Once I figured that out, hand-to-hand -hand combat became a lot easier. Shortly after that, you graduate to a machete and a handgun. The machete is not only useful for slashing troublesome bushes, as it's a very effective weapon. If an enemy shoots at you, your only defense is trying to move out of the way because the block becomes useless. But since the levels are usually so narrow, this becomes a hassle if there are more than one baddie. In that case, I found it much more efficient to bum rush them with the machete. Not only would this be more terrifying in person, but the enemies don't seem to shoot if you can get close enough to start hacking away. It takes nearly as many hits of the machete as it does the pistol to kill anyway, and you're much more liable to get shot yourself if you're attacking from a distance. Fortunately, later in the game, you're provided with more powerful weapons and body armor, but also a shield. This way you can attack from a distance without having to worry where you're going to find cover, but since it's not available until so late in the game, I found the majority of the combat frustrating. In fact, if you're playing a certain bit over and over, it's sometimes wise to just run past certain enemies if they're not actively in the way. Going through these same battles for the 10th time gets tiring quick. There are boss fights too. But luckily, these are designed in ways that don't usually require you to spam much ammo. One memorable fight against Odd Job sees you deflecting his incredibly sharp hats using the shield. You even get to fight Saddam, who may or may not be based off a real person, who is ultimately portrayed as someone weak and willing to surrender since he's so easy to defeat. Don't you just love it when politics are intertwined into video games? There are three save slots per cartridge that are kept alive by a battery. Essentially, you can save whenever you wish by pausing the game, however, what's specifically written in the manual is blatantly false. The manual mentions saving your current stock of items, which is true, but it also states that on loading a save, gameplay will pick up at the last entrance of the building you used. In practice, the game has predetermined checkpoints which are further apart than I would like. Regardless, when the game kept restarting where it begins when I started playing, I assumed the battery must be dying and even cracked open the cartridge to check it. It became obvious there wasn't anything wrong when I realised the inventory was changing with each load game, which brings me to my next point. Whenever you die, the game gives you the option of saving, but because the inventory does update and your position doesn't, sometimes it's wise to continue without saving in case you run out of ammo. You could retry a difficult combat area over and over, gradually whittling down your precious ammo and armor for the same enemies, so be careful not to trap yourself. The graphics are pleasant enough, including details such as butterflies, which I actually mistook for bugs on my screen, and varied environments that emphasise the globe-trotting nature of the movie series. This was released pretty late in the day for the Game Boy, so I imagine plenty of useful programming tricks were used to squeeze in more detail than usual. As for the 007 character sprite, there is no direct likeness to Pierce Brosman, like on the N64. I guess they couldn't afford the rights to his perfectly formed face at the time. If anything, the sprite looks more like Timothy Dalton, but I digress. Footage for this review was recorded using a Super Game Boy. There is a tacky custom background available if you're into that sort of thing, but I personally found it distracting. What is useful is the custom colour palette since the game is natively black and white. This could be turned on and off using the X button, which wasn't something I immediately figured out. I would also forget to turn it on occasionally, which is why some footage you see here is in monochrome. Not everyone owns a Super Game Boy however, so this is what it looks like on a few handhelds. Music-wise, the developers were at least granted a license to do a rendition of the famous theme song, which plays along nicely with the Game Boy's audio hardware. The rest of the music is okay, but is prone to sounding repetitive, especially if you get stuck and start to get frustrated. I'm guilty of muting the TV in on at least two occasions. Otherwise, the sound effects are a bit sparse and basic, coming off as simplistic fuds, beeps and boops, but I guess there is only so much that could be done. 
Overall, not a bad effort considering the scope of the game and the hardware it's on. It's far from the worst James Bond game I've ever played and is a nice break from the FPS laden norm. Keep in mind I only clocked up between 5 and 6 hours of game time and that includes the mindless wandering around the maze portions of the game. There's not a lot of replayability apart from the codes given so you can continue to gamble. That was certainly a nice addition, but it would have been nice if they expanded that to the rest of the levels since they're so linear. Regardless, it's well worth a play if you're a fan of the movie series. Some of the writing alone makes it worth it.